what keeps them in business? In the past, technology companies primarily sold products. They sold software, they sold gadgets, they sold devices and computers, and they still do. But today it's a little different. Today, the biggest and fastest growing tech companies are more and more in the business of selling the attention of their users. Selling the attention of their users. What does that even mean? When we use things like Facebook or Instagram or YouTube or Twitter for free, we are not the customer. We're not the customer. Advertisers are the customer. Advertisers are the ones paying these companies and driving their profits. We are the users, and we're what's being sold, or more specifically, it's our attention that is being sold to these advertisers. As they say in Silicon Valley, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. <laughs> if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. It's easy, it's easy to think of Google as just a, a search box, or Facebook is just where you go to catch up on, see what your friends are doing or your family's doing in some distant land. Or YouTube is just a place to watch cooking tutorials or figure out how to change your spark plugs or watch cat videos or epic fails. But what is their real purpose? Well, their real purpose is to make people lots of money. They're businesses. These are businesses dedicated to the modern day gold rush, competing with one another every second of every day to mine the gold that is your attention. They get paid every time we click an advertisement, every time we watch a commercial. And the more time they can get us to spend on their website, on their application, the more money they make. And they are extremely good at getting us to view, to click, and watch what they want us to. They're really good at it. Over 4.6 billion people are connected to the internet today, 4.6 billion. And nearly as many of those people, almost all of them, have smartphones and a social media account of some sort or another. In fact, according to the World Health Organization, more people have internet access today than running water in their own house. Isn't that something? On average, each of these people spends almost three and a half hours a day just using the internet on their phone. Three and a half hours. On average, two and a half of those hours are on social media. You know, so they're not catching up on business stuff. Two and a half hours on social media a day. I rather doubt any of us wake up in the morning and say, you know, I think like, uh, I'd like to spend an hour scrolling through Facebook today. Oh, maybe, you know, hop on Instagram for 30 minutes and then top it off with an hour's worth of YouTube videos. No, we have way too many important things to get done, don't we? Too many important things with our life. We don't have time for all this, but, but those are the statistics. Three and a half hours on average. Okay, well, so what? I've been talking a long time. Salespeople have been trying to sell their goods and services since time immemorial. You know, this is not new news, is it? People have been making money off advertising in print and radio and television for decades, and we've been spending hours staring at television screens for decades. This is nothing new. What is the big deal? What's the big deal? What's changed? I don't have a bigger prop because it didn't fit on my plane, but this is a radio. I think everybody's old enough to be familiar with it. <laughs> in the past, our tools were passive, reactive. They did nothing until we took action upon them. Did nothing. We act and they do what we want them to. You know, we turn the switch and it turns on. You know, we press a button and it changes the channels. We pump the brakes and the car slows down. We turn the wheel and it turns in the direction that we want it to. We act and the machine responds. But it's not so with smart devices. Not so with something like this. Now, our tools have been programmed with a mind of their own. Now they can reach out to you. Now they can recommend an action. Instead of us pressing their buttons to activate them, they're 
pressing our buttons in the hopes that we'll do what they've, they want us to do and what they've been programmed to get us to do. When's the last time your old two television or your old AM FM radio sent you a personalized message? How creepy would that be? <laughs> When's the last time your old radio notified you about a friend request or told you that those shoes that you've been looking at went on sale? When's the last time your old FM radio predicted that you needed directions home when you got into your car? or recommended a song that you might like, recognized your voice or your face and unlocked. When's the last time your FM radio harvested personal data about your interests, your likes, your dislikes, your relationships, your spending patterns, your time spent watching cat videos online, your internet search history, your daily schedule, the places you travel, and the routes you take to get there. When's the last time it told you you've been tagged in a photo, but not let you see that photo until you press a button? Today, more and more, our devices act, and we respond. More and more, our tools have artificial intelligence. This is why this is called a smartphone because it has artificial intelligence, it is not like the tools of the past that would passively wait for you to use them. You just wait there until you decided to act on that. They have been programmed to nudge us. And companies are using these tools and the technology platforms behind them to analyze us, to distract us, and to hold our attention for as long as they can so that they can make a lot of money. The big deal is that this technological system is exponentially, and I'm not exaggerating, exponentially more powerful than any communication system we have ever seen. And nearly everyone has the access and means to abuse this system. And many are. You have violent political groups, hostile nation states, Conspiracy theorists, anarchists, organized crime, greedy companies, pornographers, and the list goes on. And any and all of these groups or individuals can and do use this system to target and influence those who are the most vulnerable, those people who are the most susceptible to their particular message. They use it to scam people out of their money. They use it to steal people's identity or to choke the internet with propaganda and lies and fake news, to spread messages of distrust and fear and division, outrage and violence. Our modern day technology of the internet and smart devices is a two-edged sword. Like so many tools, it is a two-edged sword. On one hand, these are incredibly helpful tools for communication for productivity and learning. But on the other hand, they have become an engine of individual, social, and moral degradation. It's a two-edged sword. It's being referred to as human downgrading. Human downgrading. It's a new term that social scientists and technologists have recently coined to describe the combined negative effects that our digital technology is having on our society and on us individually. The term implies that the pervasive elements of technology, including smartphones, social media, and ubiquitous near constant connectivity, are degrading our character and quality of life via the increasing extraction of human intention. Family, I'd like to take our remaining time today to analyze and understand the dangers of our modern technology system of the internet, social media, and smart devices, the effects of human downgrading. Because this technological system that we have created is not only having a massive negative impact on our society, but we're also seeing these negative impacts seeping into our individual lives 
and even amongst our spiritual family. The effects of distraction, addiction, deception, division, and outrage. There is a war that we wage each day, a war that starts and revolves around the control for our attention. And we need to win it. The war for our attention, five levels of human downgrading. Five levels of human downgrading. The first level of human downgrading is driven by our modern technology is distraction. It's distraction. (laughs) How many times do you think the average American looks at their phone each day? Not just glancing at it, but actually looking down and engaging with it. Any guesses? 63. That's the number I came up with. For Americans in their teens and early 20s, some surveys say, surveys say it's as high as 86 times per day. Again, that's not just a glance. That's going down and getting into your phone and using it for a certain period of time. 86 times. While others, uh, other surveys I've read, some, some respondents say that they unlock their phone as much as 160 times per day in some of these surveys. It's crazy. We receive an average of 46 push notifications to your phone. You know, notify, notify you about one thing or another. And some marketing experts estimate that we're exposed to 4,000 to 10,000 advertisements a day. That's crazy. I I don't even know how that's possible. But even half that number seems just ridiculously high, doesn't it? How can we keep our attention focused where we need it to be, where we want it to be, when we're constantly being distracted? Something's always trying to grab our attention. The life that we've chosen, the Christian walk of ours on the path to eternal life in God's kingdom requires focus. It requires focus. It requires persistence and dedication. Growing in godly character and producing the fruit of the Spirit is our life's work, our entire life's work. It takes regular time and attention. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 4. probably wondered if this guy was ever going to open his Bible. <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4. We'll turn to verse 20. Proverbs 4.20. My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Put away from you a deceitful mouth, and put perverse lips far from you. Let your eyelids look straight ahead, and your eyelids look right before you. Ponder the path of your feet, and let all your ways be established. Do not turn to the right or the left. Remove your your foot from evil. You need to stay focused. There's nothing inherently wrong with using social media, or for example, there's, there's nothing wrong with keeping up with the news every day. There's nothing wrong with having a hobby or shopping or with eating or with exercising or with watching certain movies. The problem is that these fine, perfectly acceptable activities all require an amount of our attention. They all require a certain amount of attention. And there is a fixed and unalterable limit on exactly how much time and attention each of us has available to invest each day. Now, we all have the same 24 hours each day, and we all have to decide where those hours go. In Ephesians 5.15, just for your notes, Ephesians 5.15 says, See then, then you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Now, it can be so easy to become absorbed in certain things, and entertainment, and interests, and hobbies, and even reading the news, to a point where it becomes detrimental to our spiritual life. You spend too much time on other things, you don't have enough time for the spiritual things, to a point where we start neglecting meditation, or prayer, or Bible study, and relationships with our family and friends. Distraction matters, because our time, our attention, is a precious and finite resource. And when someone can hold our attention, 
They can influence our thoughts. They can influence our beliefs and ultimately our actions. Because the war for our attention is ultimately about influencing our actions. And that's what our digital technology is programmed to do. Distraction is the means to an end. Now, what advertisers are after isn't your attention necessarily. It's the means to an end. And when I say advertisers, let me clarify. I mean just about anyone. You know, not just companies, but any of those groups that I listed earlier. Anyone who can put something up online. What advertisers are after is the gradual, slight, imperceptible change in our behavior and perception, and that results from how we spend our time and attention. We give something enough of our time and attention, it can influence our thoughts and behaviors, which leads us to the second level of human downgrading, and that is addiction. Addiction. Captology is the study of computers as persuasive technologies. This includes the design, the research, and analysis of interactive computing products and services created for the purpose of changing people's attitudes and behaviors. Programming everything that we know about the psychology of persuasion into technology. In the early 2000s, when most of the internet and social media giants were still in their infancy, they were just, just getting going, many of the big thinkers that studied, that are around today, they studied captology at places such as the Stanford Persuasive Tech Lab. In 2004, the stated purpose of the Stanford Persuasive Technology Lab was to, quote, create insight into how computing products from websites to mobile phone software can be designed to change what people believe and what they do. This program was focused on using technology to change our thoughts and behaviors so they could influence our actions. Essentially what this program did was teach technologists how to manipulate vulnerabilities in human psychology. Vulnerabilities such as bad forecasting for example, which is our tendency to tell ourselves, that won't take long. <laughs> this is one of the reasons they created notifications. Dling, you have an email. That won't take long. Dling, Jill tagged you in a photo on Facebook. That'll just take me a second to look at. <laughs> 40 minutes later, you're still scrolling. And there are five new tabs open in your internet browser. <laughs> and your value, just like that, your value to those tech companies went up. The ones mining for your time goes up because every ad you scroll past, every commercial you pause and look at, everything you click is money in their pockets. Another vulnerability that Captology teaches tech, no, tech companies to target is our desire for quick and easy gratification. And they use an approach that psychologists call positive intermittent reinforcement. It's positive intermittent reinforcement. Have you ever noticed on your Facebook feed, on your phone, or on the computer, uh, when you pull down on the top and refresh the page, new posts appear every time. Every time you refresh that page, brand new posts appear. It didn't used to be this way. Now, Facebook posts used to appear in sequential order based on when people posted it. You know, if it was posted recently, it'd be right at the top. If it was posted five days ago, it'd be further down. But that's not the case in now. Now, different posts will appear whenever you refresh your page. Fresh content for you to peruse every time you pull down on your touch screen. This is positive intermittent reinforcement, and it's been proven to be highly successful, highly successful for holding people's attention. In fact, it's the same theory behind the design of the slot machine. And there's a reason why casinos make 65 to 85% of their entire profit on slot machines. <laughs> when studying captology, technologists also learned how to design applications that would appeal to our innate aversion to loss. Uh, more commonly known as FOMO. You've probably heard the term. It stands for fear of missing out. FOMO. So applications are designed to make us feel like we need to 
remain constantly connected, keep it right here in the breast pocket all the time, always there, or we'll miss something important. We'll miss something that we could have you know, been involved in, something important to us. Just ask yourself, have you ever seen someone panic when their phone runs out of batteries? Or have this look on their face like they've lost their wedding ring or an appendage because they can't find their device? <laughs> How strongly do you feel the need to glance at your screen whenever your phone vibrates? How strong is that desire? Do you bring it with you to the dinner table? Do you bring it with you to bed each night? To the bathroom in the morning? <laughs> in a recent documentary about this called The, uh, the Social Dilemma, this gentleman, one gentleman asked, he said, do you check your smartphone before you go to the bathroom in the morning? or while you go to the bathroom. Because those are the only two options. <laughs> That's FOMO in action. Actually, my mother-in-law shared with me that at the laboratory where she works, she's a lab technician, and at the lab where she worked, some employees actually quit their jobs because they weren't allowed to bring their cell phones into the clean room, into the clean room where they were doing all the test labs. They quit. Wow. And there are other psychological vulnerabilities that they target as well, which I won't go into for the sake of time. But the point is that these companies have rigorously studied how to make their technology as persuasive as possible. Everything they do on these devices is calibrated specifically, even like the color of different things, like your notifications. What color is that little bubble on an application? It's red. Why is it red? Because it gets your attention. It's important. If it was blue, you'd be like, eh. <laughs> must not be that important. They design every feature about their tools and services so that they can target our psychological vulnerabilities as effectively as possible so that we stay hooked to our screens as long as possible. And they're constantly getting better at this because these digital tech companies monitor nearly everything that we do online or on our devices and when we're accessing their applications, every data point, every action that they're allowed to monitor, they do. They track it, they analyze it, they measure it. Every action that we take, every interest we share, every web page, video, and post that we look at, and how long we look at them. Every strategy they then use to distract and persuade us is measured, is tweaked and adjusted, and continuously improved based on how effective it was at stealing our attention. And when it gets calibrated in, they keep using it over and over again. And the more data we give them, the more time we give them, the more they watch and learn about us, the better they understand our individual vulnerabilities, us personally. The better they get at controlling our attention. And if they can repeatedly distract us, if they can repeatedly distract us, they begin to ingrain habits. And if a habit becomes strong enough, it can become an addiction. The famous Yale technology professor, Edward Tufte, has a quote that I find rather insightful regarding this. He said, there are only two industries that call their customers users, illegal drugs and software. <laughs> are we addicted to our technology or the content that we find on it, to our phones, to our social media, to internet news? When surveyed, 50% of American teens and 60% of college students openly admit to being addicted to their cell phones. They admit it. How many more are just simply in denial? <laughs> I've read some statistics that say as high as 79% of adults are addicted to their smartphones. Four out of five. What about us personally, though? How much time do we spend on our phone or on our computer? What specifically are we looking at? What applications? What websites or content? Are these interests of ours preventing us from focusing on more important things and more spiritual things? Addictions are typically defined as a compulsive, damaging behavior that is difficult to stop. Now, when we have an addiction, we lose self-control. Let's turn to Proverbs 25. And we'll read verse 28.
Proverbs 25 and verse 28. It says simply, whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. When we have an addiction to something, we lose self-control. We're like, as we read here, we become defenseless to our addiction, like a city broken down without walls. Can't defend ourselves from attack. They get through every time. Remember that these tech companies make money when you give them your attention. So their algorithms are constantly learning to provide you with a never-ending bombardment of content that they hope you just can't resist. You know, content aimed at finding and exploiting the weak points in your walls. And once they find these weak points in our walls, the right topics, the right content or approach that we just can't seem to resist, the system attacks that vulnerability, that gap in your wall, time and again, and suddenly, it seems like every page you look at on the internet has advertisements related to that. I wasn't even on this page. How does this know that I was looking at that content five seconds ago or yesterday? Our social media feed highlights videos about it. At the top of our news feed starts featuring articles about that thing because it's all interconnected. It's all programmed together. In the parable of the sower, Christ describes how God's word is a seed sown in, the, sown in the soil of our hearts. But depending on the soil, that seed either produces fruit or it withers away. Let's look at one of the things that can cause it to wither away in Mark 4, in verse 18. Mark chapter 4, in verse 18. And Christ says, Now these are the seeds sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. We can spend all day online, all day in front of a, a screen learning about things or watching entertainment or <laughs> the internet and all our devices is going to encourage us to stay online, to stay staring at your screen by constantly recommending content that's shown itself of interest to us. But we can't let our interests become the weeds that choke the precious truth that God has sown in our hearts. Let's look at one last verse on this point in Joshua chapter 1, in verse 7. Joshua 1 and verse 7, this is... God's direction to Joshua after he had been chosen to lead Israel into the promised land. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper Wherever you go, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. This path requires focus. When we become addicted to something, our thoughts are always drifting to it. Always drifting to it. The addiction becomes the thing that is always in the back of your mind, crowding other things out. It's things that should be there instead. Crowding out those things that should be there are constant meditation, God's word, his coming kingdom, and his plan for us. These are the things that should be our primary focus. These should be our addiction, our good addiction, as it were, and ever present in our hearts and minds. And the third level of human downgrading is deception. 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 Yeah. Since Satan's deception in the Garden of Eden, mankind has had to deal with the terrible consequences of lies. But today, it, it just seems like we're drowning in them, doesn't it? In the past, you had to spend a lot of money and time to broadcast a message to a national or international audience. 
You needed to use a printing press or a radio tower or a television station and all the expensive infrastructure and all the employees needed to, pr to produce content via these methods. A great deal of time and money and frankly only a very small percentage of people had the ability to take advantage of these kind of broadcast methods. And once you had made this investment, you couldn't just broadcast whatever you wanted. You could just send out whatever message you wanted. There were laws and regulations around what you can and cannot say and real consequences if you violate those laws. And additionally, there were social consequences. If you were deceiving or misleading, you had to maintain your reputation. And otherwise, if you're caught in a lie or not seen as reputable or trustworthy, networks wouldn't air your message. Well, people wouldn't listen to what you had to say and you'd run yourself out of business. But today, this isn't the case. Today, nearly anyone can say anything, anything they want online and post it on a website, put it up on a blog or throw it on social media or put it in a YouTube video at little or no cost. It's a free service. And then share it with the world. Billions of people. No fact checking, no editorial process required. There are little or no consequences if the information is false or inflammatory or just downright evil. If you do suffer some sort of consequences, you put something out there, you do suffer some consequences, you get banned from a social media site perhaps or have your website pulled down or what have you, but it's quick, it's cheap, and it's easy just to simply start all over again. Just throw up a new website, start a new social media account. People can and do make any claim that they wish with or without evidence. And worse yet, they make up evidence to make their lies all the more convincing. Creating fake documents, fake audio, doctored photographs, and fake videos now. And these things can look just like the real thing because people take advantage the same skills, the same tools and technology today that we use to create high-end special effects in cinematic pictures to create fake audio and fake video content. We now live in a world where people can create and distribute as truth false videos that are as realistic as something that you'd see in a motion picture. Videos that look and sound like real recordings of politicians, of reporters and other famous people. Videos that bad actors manufacture as evidence to support their own agenda, discredit their opposition and deceive the masses into becoming unwitting pawns to support their theory, their agenda. Let's turn to 2 Timothy, chapter three. Second Timothy three in verse one. But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, unslanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. And from such people, turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Jumping to verse 13. But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. This is a set of verses that we read often. I feel reg pretty regularly. And they always, it seems like every time I read them, that they describe our modern era more and more accurately with each passing year. It seems just more and more fitting every time we turn to these pages and read those verses. Our technology has empowered us to reach unprecedented levels of deception. Our news has become so saturated with contradictory facts and opposing reports that it, it feels almost 
impossible at times to discern truth from lies. I'm going to read a few true or false statements that summarize popular topics. You know, popular topics and theories and news stories. But let me preface this by saying that I'm not endorsing any of these things to be true or false. But I'd like to read them to illustrate a point. As I read them, I'd like you just to answer them in your head as either true or false. True or false, the Apollo moon landings really happened. True or false, the 2020 presidential election was fair and legal. True or false, the 2016 election was fair and legal. True or false, the earth is round. True or false, climate change is a hoax. True or false, dinosaurs did not exist. True or false, Lee Harvey Oswald assassinated John F. Kennedy on his own. True or false, COVID-19 is no more dangerous than the flu. True or false, wearing a mask offers some protection against spreading or contracting COVID-19. True or false, vaccines are generally safe and effective. If we were to compare everyone's answers to these questions, I am certain that we would have some variability. Your brethren, your fellow members in God's church, do not agree on all these topics. There is so much disinformation out there, such a mixture of truth and lies, that if you wanted to prove or disprove any of these true or false statements that I just asked, any of them, you could find page upon page, video upon video, supporting either side of these arguments. What are the correct answers to these questions? Well, I'm not gonna provide you with an answer sheet by any means. I don't know all these answers, frankly, but neither do I believe that it is important for our Christian walk to know all these answers. Let's turn to Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Colossians 2 and verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. The true or false questions that I just asked are not spiritual questions. They are not. They are questions about political issues, historical events, and scientific facts. That's what they're questions about. As we just read, they fall into the categories of philosophy, of empty deceit, of traditions of men, and the basic principles of the world. They are not according to Christ. They're not doctrinal questions. We do not need to agree on them or be right about them to be in God's church or to inherit eternal life. And I'm not saying that it's wrong to have an opinion about them, but it is wrong to let our beliefs about worldly matters divide us on a spiritual level. Unfortunately and very sadly, you know, Satan has used non-spiritual matters such as these to create contention and sow dissension within God's church. And these 
feelings can lead to misunderstandings and hurt feelings, arguments and offenses, and even divisions between brethren. And that brings us to our next point, the fourth level of human downgrading. And that is division. Division. If you were to pull out your phone right now and go to Google and type in the words, climate change is, and pause, you're going to see different search recommendations to autofill the rest of that statement, depending on things such as your current location. So in some cities, you're more likely to see this search autocomplete to ch climate change is a hoax. In other cities, you're going to see climate change is causing the destruction of nature. And that is a function not of what is true about climate change. That is a function about Google's, that is related to Google's search algorithm. It's tied to the Google search algorithm, which personalizes your search results based on your interests, your language, your current location, your search history, and also based on the interests of that, the people that you're connected to on social media. Your search results differ based on all these different variables. In fact, if you and your best friend were to open up your Facebook page right now and look at your feed, you might expect to see the same sets of updates, the same information for the most part, because you essentially share the same set of friends. But you don't. You don't see the same feed. You'd see completely different updates from different people in a different order, interspersed with different advertisements and different recommendations. Imagine picking up the news 30 years ago, newspaper, and having it be different for every person that picked it up. Different articles, different headlines, different front page. That's what it's like today. In trying to serve up content that suits all of our interests individually, many of the sites and services on the internet have become highly personalized. The problem with this is that these services heavily prioritize content for us that we viewed, liked, shared or expressed interest in the past. And it deprioritizes that content that doesn't align with our views, our likes, and our interests in the things that we've looked at in the past. Social media is the ultimate yes man. It's the friend who always agrees with you and will go to great lengths to support and reinforce whatever your opinion is. And what happens when everyone is in the same boat, everybody's in that same boat, seeing reams of content and arguments online that reinforce their opinion and worldview, and seeing little to nothing that argues the opposing side. Let's turn to the book of Proverbs again. Let's go to Proverbs 18 and verse 17. What happens when we only ever see one side of the argument? Proverbs 18.17 reads, The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. When we only hear one side of an argument, it's going to seem right. Especially when it seems like everything we're seeing supports that argument. If we only hear the evidence that supports the prosecution's case, why would we ever side for the defense? Or vice versa. This is part of the reason we're seeing sharper divisions in our society today. Because they're not analyzing both sides of the story to the same degree. They're in a sort of digital echo chamber where nearly everything they see or hear reinforces their beliefs They're, and reassures them just how wrong the opposition is. And frankly, when they do see something that contradicts their opinion, it's, it's very easy just to dismiss it as lies and fake news. There's so much deception out there. I don't think anyone would disagree with me when I say that we live in an increasingly divided society. The divisions within our country are just are broad and deep. And everyone's, <laughs> no matter where you stand, everyone feels that they're on the side of truth and justice in the American way. But where do we stand in all of this. 
Who do we believe? Whom do we support? What about us, brethren? Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Let's start reading in verse 14. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, for the second glass of water. I appreciate that. (laughs) 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. We have been called to be first fruits in God's kingdom. We know that. To prepare ourselves for the awesome responsibility of reigning as kings and priests. And God tells us here in these verses that we're to stand apart, not to pick sides in the world's disputes. What is almost always the case is that neither side of the argument is wholly right, is wholly on God's side. Generally, what people are just doing is picking between lesser evils. We are called to stand at Christ's side, to stand separately and follow him. When Christ came to this earth in the first century, he came to a land that was under harsh Roman rule. Came to Judea. Judea was under military occupation by hostile nation. They had soldiers walking in their streets, garrisoned in their cities. Hostile nation. And many of the Jews were trying to overthrow this oppressive foreign power. And were actively looking for a Messiah who would come and deliver them from the Romans. And what did Christ do? Did he stand with his countrymen to throw off their oppressors? Did he speak out against the injustices and the wrongdoings of the Roman occupiers? No. He didn't. Didn't he care? Didn't he care about their plight? Didn't he see that they were suffering? Didn't he see the injustice all around him? Didn't he have the power to do something about it? Yes. Yes, he did. Just look at the multitudes of the people that he healed, the compassion that he showed while he was there. He cared. But Christ didn't come to bring temporary solutions to a single nation in history. He came to bring permanent solutions for all humanity, all of God's children, down through history. Let's turn to the book of Luke. We'll read Luke chapter 4. Let's start in verse 16. Luke 4 and verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Christ came to fulfill this mission, to preach the good news of God's coming kingdom and set us free from the oppression of death and the penalty of sin, which is death, eternal death, to bring us real and lasting hope. He was focused on far weightier matters than the current Roman occupation of Judea. He didn't come just to make a few people's lives physically better. 
He came to bring permanent and effective solutions to all mankind's problems. Solutions for every human being who's ever lived. We also have an important mission. A mission our Savior gave to his church before ascending into heaven. Let's turn to Matthew and we'll read this. Matthew 28. Matthew 28, verse 18. This is the mission our Savior gave to us. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all these things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Oftentimes we summarize these verses with, Preach the gospel, prepare the church. That is our mission. Earlier in Matthew 24, 14, for your notes, Matthew 24, 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as witness to all nations, and then the end will come. We have a mission. We have a work to do. And there is no greater, better, or more important calling on earth. God did not call us just to make our present world a little better. He has chosen us to help make it permanently better. We are not able to fix this world's problems on our own. And standing along man's battle lines will never bring lasting resolution. Only God can do that. And he's offered us a part in that. And what a great honor that is. Our kingdom is not of this world. We don't stand on battle lines drawn by man or Satan. We stand at God's side. And we wait for a time when all these battle lines will be erased. And everyone will stand in happiness and peace and harmony at God's side. I have one last point that I'd like to cover today. One last level of human downgrading. And that is outrage. Outrage. The year 2020, I imagine, will likely go down in history as the year of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm sure we'll always kind of remember it that way. But I think, for me, it will be forever etched in my mind as the year that Americans started using mob violence to achieve their political ends. This past year has been a very sad and sobering one. You know, see that you watch the videos of angry protesters invading our nation's capital, or other angry rioters taking over whole neighborhoods, holding them hostage. People looting and burning the homes of businesses, of innocent bystanders, in cities across the nation. Violent armed mobs from opposing factions in the streets, and politicians in offices, low and high, egging them on if they support their beliefs, and condemning them to be punished if they oppose them. And all sides claim to be fighting for truth and justice, standing up for what's right. Fighting against tyranny, standing up for what is right because the system is broken. So they need to take matters into their own hands by force, if necessary. The ends justify the means. Where's all this anger and hatred and violence coming from? Let's turn to Revelation. Revelation chapter 12. And we'll read starting in verse 7.
Revelation 12 and verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail. Nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. I spent a lot of time in this message talking about tech companies, not exactly painting them in the most positive of lights, <laughs> looking at the system that they've created that's amplifying a lot of problems. But they are not the villains. Nor do I believe that they created their programs or applications and devices to degenerate humanity. I don't believe that personally. No, I, I like to think they created tools that they thought people would want and provide services that would help them make money, their businesses. But these tools have been horribly abused. And they produced a lot of unforeseen consequences. Satan has taken their plowshares and shown us how we can shape them into swords. Satan is most definitely the villain, and he absolutely abuses and corrupts everything, everything he can to our detriment. He is tempting mankind to use these incredibly powerful tools that we've created as weapons to accelerate us down a path towards self-destruction because he knows his time is short, his end is near, and his rage is spreading in people's hearts. Many outrageous things have been happening and will continue to happen in our world and in our country, and that is upsetting. Evil and justice and murder and violence and lies and deception and oppression and abuse. All these things are upsetting. But is anger what we should be feeling right now? Should we be outraged? Let's turn to Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9, this is before God, before God used the Babylonians to destroy Jerusalem and the first temple, during that first time of Jacob's trouble, God sent an angel to place a mark on those in Jerusalem who would be spared, those who had remained faithful to him despite all the evil that was swirling around them. And God told this angel how he would be able to identify those who should receive this mark those who would be spared from Jerusalem's imminent destruction. Let's start reading in Ezekiel 9 and verse 4. Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub, where it had been, to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen, the angel, who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. God had an angel set his mark on all those who would be spared from Jerusalem's coming destruction, all those who sigh and cry over the abominations that were done within it. Why those who sigh and cry, brethren? Why did God use that description as the way the angel would recognize those people who remained faithful. Why not just say, put a mark on those who remained faithful? Who sighs and cries? 
those who are grieved to see all the evil around them. Those who are deeply saddened by the cruel consequences of sin. They want to see their neighbor whom they love commit evil. Who see their nation that they love turn from God and deny his existence and revile his great name. God did not tell the angel to go into the city and put a mark on those who demand justice, who cry out for change, who rise up in protest and rebellion. Let's turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5 and verse 1. Commonly called the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, 1, and seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice. And be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We, the people of God, do not arm ourselves and rise up in rebellions to throw down governments. Christ himself said in John 18, 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now... My kingdom is not from here. So we do not fight. We do not embrace anger. We do not support lawlessness or pursue vengeance. We are called to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We are to be humble, loving, and gentle, patient, and kind. We are sheep amongst wolves. We are meant to be hopeful and joyful, faithful, and merciful, to have our words seasoned with salt, so we may speak out of love, to be slow to anger, slow to wrath, for we know the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Outrage has been growing for some time now. In this past year or so, all the more so. But what saddens me even more is it's not just growing out in the world. We've seen examples of it at times seeping into God's church here and there. You know, causing offenses, driving us apart from one another, isolating us from each other, even causing some to drift from the faith and, and the support of their spiritual family. Let's turn to one last passage on this point, First Peter chapter 3. And we'll read verse 8. First Peter 3, starting in verse 8. <laughs> Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And who is he who will harm you? 
if you become followers of what is good. But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed and do not be afraid of their threats nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience. And when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better, if it is the will of God, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. In the 1930s, Herbert W. Armstrong used the latest and most powerful communication tool that had yet been devised to broadcast the good news. Through the power of this tool, the radio, God did a great work spreading his gospel message around the world. Back then, the church was even called the Radio Church of God. This communication tool was used for great good. But during this same time, during this same decade, Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party turned this powerful tool into a weapon to bombard the airwaves of Germany with hate and lies. Lies that targeted people's vulnerabilities, their hurts, their disappointments, their desires, their angers, and their fears. Lies begat division. Division begat outrage. And outrage led to violence, and violence sparked revolution, and the Nazis overthrew the German government. And they established the Third Reich. And just a few years later, the world was locked in just the most devastating, horrific war in history. The radio. How much more powerful is this tool? How minuscule is the potential of a radio when compared to the potential of the internet and our modern technology? Brethren, we live in a divided and increasingly angry world that will only become more so as we approach the end of this present evil age. Hatred and violence and war will continue to increase as Satan sees his reign coming to an end. Now is not the time to become distracted. Now is not the time to be wrapped up in the cares and interests and concerns of this world. We must not allow ourselves to get sucked in by the rhetoric and the lies, be used as pawns of men, to become tricked into choosing sides in worldly struggles between wrong and mostly wrong, or kind of right and somewhat right. To be fooled into thinking that this world's problems can be solved by one leader or another, or one party or another, or one nation or another. God our Father sees our suffering. He knows our pain. And he also knows the cure. He has a plan And it's our only hope. It's our only hope. It's going to get much worse before it gets better. But it will get better. I'd like to read one last passage. Let's go to Psalms chapter 37. And we'll start reading in verse 1. Psalms 37 and verse 1. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. 
Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. <laughs>